Hi, it's wonderful to be here with you today. There are many talks and books out there that will teach you or attempt to teach you how to get ahead in life, to climb the veritable ladder of success. This is not one of those talks. This is a talk on how to get behind in life and why that is so terribly, terribly important. It's also a talk about time travel. And it's a talk about seeing the sacred through the lens of the scientific. Because I believe these to be inextricably intertwined. Now, you know times are changing radically when the director of NIH, who is also the director of the Human Genome Project, publishes in the most recent issue of National Geographic an article entitled, Why I'm a Man of Science and Faith, unapologetically. And he's even created an initiative called uh, the BioLogos Initiative, uh, which is designed to foster communications about science and about faith. But for me, one of the watershed moments, several watershed moments have come is students, especially many of you out here, uh, I mean, some of you have literally helped carry me through the last many years. Um, as students have approached me openly and kindly shared their lives and their faiths and where, they, where they've come from and their perspectives. And one of these students is a brilliant William & Mary alumnus and an alumnus of my class that I could not be prouder of named Masrur Islam. Now, I, I am no scholar of the Quran nor do I pretend to be, so I'll simply explain things as he explained them to me. He was kind enough and bold enough to come up to me after class one day, and we were talking, and he said, did you know that there was a passage in the Quran that says, those who seek after knowledge, those who are the scientists, are the closest to God because they know his handiwork. And I just, I glowed for what, maybe three or four weeks afterwards. I'm still glowing. At what a beautiful way this is to look at the world. This is what we should be about as the academy. Now, how do we know when we're dealing with science? Well, the fundamental question of science is why do we think we know what we think we know? And we know we're doing science because there are a lot of complicated equations involved. And uh, <clears throat> those complicated equations, which are well worth solving, I assure you, they're absolutely joyful. Uh, we then engage in a hilarious process known as simplification, where we draw helpful diagrams like the following. <clears throat> When we're asking questions about the sacred, when we're asking questions about faith, is the question really any different? We still want to know why we think we know what we think we know. And this is one of the beautiful things that I've seen changing as, as, as students have opened up and come forward and engaged in these incredible conversations, um, people from very, very diverse backgrounds. So what, what is our purpose? If, if we're scientists studying the universe, then, then why was it structured the way it was structured? Is there maybe a message here for us to, 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 to find? And, and, and where do we get our value from, anyhow? What's our worth? Now, scientists are also obsessed with symmetries. And one of the reasons that we're obsessed with symmetries is that uh, a woman named Emmy Noether overcame immense discrimination and terrible odds to show to us, among other things, that symmetries imply physical laws. <clears throat> you may have heard of a few of these physical laws. For example, the principle of, le le well, it's a principle of stationary action, sometimes mislabeled the principle of least action, um, which is responsible for mechanics and a lot of optics. Uh, special relativity by Einstein uh, may also be familiar. That's also the result of recognizing a symmetry. Finally, the theory of general relativity also comes from recognizing a symmetry. In fact, I could go on and on and on about how many symmetries lead to physical laws. 
But there's something else extremely neat, known as the isomorphism. And this is familiar in mathematics. It's also familiar in physics. But we love to say the word in, in mathematics. Uh, <coughs> but uh, simply put, an isomorphism is when two objects, no matter how different they appear at first glance, prove on rigorous, and I do mean rigorous, careful structural inspection, to be absolutely identical. So, for example, some homework for you. Um, <clears throat> if you look at graph A and you look at graph B and simply look at which nodes are connected by which edges, you'll discover that graph A is the same as graph B. They're isomorphic. But does this ever happen? And what does this have to do with time travel? I am so glad you asked. Because <coughs> a valid question is, if time travel happens, would we even notice it? Now, this was put forth by Richard Feynman and, and von Stuckelberg in the mid-1940s. Uh, it's a point in quantum electrodynamics, actually. And they pointed out that you really can't tell the difference, physically speaking, between matter moving forward in time, colliding with matter moving backward in time, and then continuing their passage after an exchange of energy, and matter and antimatter colliding, producing a burst of energy that then gets transformed into matter and antimatter. So time travel could be happening all the time, so to speak, uh, but we might not know it. They're isomorphic. Fortunately, and I use fortunately in the loosest possible uh, sense of the word, as the good doctor knows, uh, we have this thing called entropy uh, at the macroscopic scale, uh, i.e. the arrow of time. And we know entropy principally at, uh, through the lens of the second law of thermodynamics, which states that in a closed system, the system will move from a state of higher order or, or lesser entropy to a, a state of lesser order. Information is lost and entropy increases. Now this is remarkable and it's intertwined with what the good doctor was just saying about uh, how, do, how do we know? Because uh, entropy is constantly moving forward and its force is exerted on each and every one of us. Its origins are quantum in nature. Uh, if you'd like, uh, please see me at the reception. I'll be happy to talk with you about them. Or you can check the references above or Richard Feynman's lectures on computation. Now, what does entropy look like? Well, <clears throat> I don't have medical illustrations handy, unfortunately. But uh, in this case, entropy uh, manifests as a thermal diffusion. And we see, that, um, <clears throat> we see that I've generated this wonderful initial signal at time zero. And it's very pronounced, and you can tell what it is, and I can send it through a speaker system, and it will annoy your neighbors. Um, but as time goes on, that signal fades. And ultimately, over time, it's impossible to tell what my original signal was. The information has been lost. This is the nature of thermal diffusions. But a lot of my work is in the realm of quantitative finance. That's right, making money. Um, which is, of course, what this talk is all about, <coughs> profiteering. And we seldom are privileged with initial conditions in quantitative finance. Um, we often wish that we were. Sometimes we even think that we are, <coughs> but no. What we do have the benefit of, however, is what is known as a final condition. Uh, in other words, when we work with derivative contracts, Think of a derivative as a contract or a bet on different states of the world. And if I know what the state of the world is at the expiration date of the contract, then I know exactly what that contract is going to pay off at that point in time. Well, if I know the future, can I begin to work that backwards to today and see what things should be worth? Well, it turns out to be answer is yes. And uh, there are many places that will help, uh, help you learn that, William and Mary being one of them. Um, <clears throat> uh, but yes, one can work backwards and find uh, valuations 
and perhaps most importantly, misvaluations, which occur far more frequently than, than we would ever guess, quite frankly. Um, <clears throat> so uh, when we find those misvaluations, we're able to extract what's known as an arbitrage, or an instantaneous risk-free profit. Uh, now this is just a simple simulation I threw together. Uh, it actually involves model independent risk and transaction costs. And here a, a relatively slight discrepancy has just led to a profit of about, what, $36,000 over an incredibly short time period while bearing effectively zero risk. Needless to say, this has attracted all kinds of altruists and philosophers and the occasional person who's not allergic to money uh, <clears throat> and for quantitative finance. Now, what does this look like over time? What would it be like if everybody did this. So if everyone was seeking an instantaneous risk-free profit, what would the end result be? Oh good, a graph. I hope he's going to present an equation. Uh, I was going to, but then I, some friends talked me out of it. Because the equation that describes that surface turns out to be the exact same equation that describes thermal diffusion. That's extremely interesting. Um, but there's a difference. Uh, the, um, so it turns out, so that describes diffusion. Um, how much information could I encode? Well, here I've just expanded with some simple vanilla options and, and sent a stepwise signal over time. And you can see as we work backwards in time, you can see that the information is lost. So it becomes more and more difficult to tell what the value is in the past. But as you move towards the future, all of a sudden, your entropy is not increasing. Your entropy is decreasing. And that's where the 36,000 bucks came from. Not bad, huh? <clears throat> so I could encode a lot of information in this kind of a system in the final conditions. And it would propagate backwards to, the, theoretically, the beginning of time. Um, in fact, I could have uh, used Morse code to actually send this lecture back in time. And this leads us to an absolutely remarkable symmetry. It's an isomorphism under time reversal, or it can be viewed as a time symmetry. In other words, a forward diffusion in time, entropy, decay, the second law of thermodynamics, so what we've just heard discussed so much, <coughs> turns into a backwards diffusion in the realm of quantitative finance. So in other words, the only difference is that we have positive time in the standard physics problem, and we have, and we have negative time in the finance example. So this is a remarkable symmetry, not just between equations and between physical laws, but this is a symmetry that stems across fields. <clears throat> so what does this mean to me personally? Because I, I begin by speaking about faith through the lens of, of the scientific. And so I want to share with you one of the most perplexing pieces of scripture I've encountered. Uh, it's among many things I don't know. Um, it's from the, the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 16. And in it, Jesus says something that simply makes no sense at all whatsoever, if you're honest about it, right? Well, I mean, think about this. Whosoever would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, that's an instrument of death, and follow me. For whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. This is a madman, clearly. I mean, he's saying, give up your life and you'll find it. Well, I, 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 see, I see a little bit of a contradiction there. Um, find life and whoop, it's gone. Uh, this is, uh, <clears throat> this is quite, quite challenging. But wait, what did we just see? We saw that what we think of as life, as Dr. Castro recently just pointed out, what we think of as life is actually death, is it not? 
because with every second of time, entropy has increased. We'd like to think we've spent the last several hours living our lives together. In a sense, that's true. But scientifically speaking, we've spent the last several hours dying together. And this is why working backwards in time is so important. Not so much the getting ahead. So, see, <clears throat> is there a way that we can travel in time? And my goal is to enable all of you to be time travelers by the time you exit this room. In fact, some of you are traveling in different directions in time than the people around you think you are. I promise you. So is there an arbitrage to be seized? Well, what, what do we learn from, as it were, the, the parable of the arbitrageur, the seeker of instantaneous risk-free profits? The altruists at Goldman Sachs or J.P. Morgan, you know, working every day hard to bring the market into equilibrium. Well, the first lesson is we buy things that are undervalued. And we sell the other stuff to do it. And I personally cannot think of one asset that is more undervalued today than people. Now, maybe the market's fairly valued people, right? We've got a free market system or something like it. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe people have been, uh, been valued pro uh, properly. So maybe there are not arbitrage opportunities available in life. There's no, no instantaneous risk-free uh, return, no way to go back in time and begin reversing entropy. So is arbitrage possible? Well, speaking from my own experience, seldom does a day go by that I don't see arbitrage opportunities everywhere. How many times just today have you seen one human being treat another human being as if they were less than who the other person is, or less than who that person actually is? When was the last time, and I mean this for, for uh, adults, and I mean this for, for, for college students, and I mean this for high school students and everyone. When was the last time you looked in the mirror and you valued yourself according to your projected salary, uh, according to your projected occupation, according to what your boyfriend or girlfriend you think thinks about you? When was the last time you assigned that kind of a value to yourself? Because if you have misvalued yourself, then there is indeed arbitrage waiting. Speaking as an economist, I believe that a good or service is worth what someone is freely willing to pay. No more, no less. As a Christian, and I say that not to force my worldview upon you, but to be honest about where I'm coming from so we can have a conversation. Um, as a Christian, I believe that the most precious gift imaginable, Jesus gave himself freely for each and every one of you. What does that mean for me in terms of seeing the world? For me, it means every single one of you is of inestimable worth and value, regardless of your faith. And that's very important to remember. Regardless of your faith, regardless of whether your life seems like it's in order or not. You are precious and you are valuable. Yes, arbitrage is available. I will move backwards in time. Now, I also want to let you know about a little secret. We are seeing within the academy, both with students and faculty, I want you to know that scientists don't just celebrate their scientific discoveries together. They, they celebrate their spiritual discoveries together as two. And that transcends faith. Many people of, of different faiths celebrate discoveries they've made about God. How is this possible, especially referring to the, the earlier talk, especially given the news? How is this possible that people of different faiths could actually enjoy a conversation with one another? Well, I believe three things are critical to this. The first is the axiom that God exists and that he created things so that we could understand him. This is a common basis for understanding faith and seeking God together. 
The second is the axiom that God is not fragile. He's not afraid of questions. You're not going to stump him. The third, and this may be the hardest for many people of all persuasions to grasp, is the axiom that even if we come from different faiths, many of us share identical axioms. And to the extent that we share identical axioms, we can grow together and discover things about God that we never would have known otherwise. But finally, I want to tell you about the boundary condition. Because as Dr. Kastrick knows, there's some extremely terrible places this life can take you. And if you've read my bio, I've gotten to experience many of them. I've gotten to experience that boundary condition at life's breath of this, looking back. Looking back and seeing how the contract was valued at expiry. I don't know if your experience will be like mine, but if it is, let me tell you what you'll see. Your resume will not matter. Your job will not matter in the least. The size of your home or whether you own a boat will not matter. The only thing that you will care about is how much you've given, how much you've loved, how much have you loved your family, how much have you loved those around you, how much have you loved even those who hate you, and will it be enough to carry them through the night seasons when you're not there for them? With this, I invite you to grow young with me, to walk backwards in time, and extract the greatest arbitrage of all. Thank you. I look forward to seeing you.